Uh, so t today's speaker is Jacob Feldman over here, um, who I'm very pleased to, to have uh, both for our center as a whole, but also personally. Jacob was a graduate of our department, and he was just finishing up his PhD thesis when I started here, um, actually kind of in the summer before school. And um, I, we spent a lot of time together. <laughs> that. I helped out a little bit as, uh, on some of his research on blickets of the day. And um, I think we, had, we, had, we wound up having the same PhD advisor. And I think in many ways, um, Jacob set really the ideal example for me of like what, what it was to think hard about an important problem <laughs> as a student in this place. And he has done that his, and, and continued to do that about many of the same problems and in, in, uh, expanding array of problems for his entire career since then. Um, he has received a number of honors. He received the Trolland Award, I think, right? Um, kind of about the highest honor you can get for uh, doing formal models of cognition. Um, he has published papers in Nature, a number of other great places, you know, pretty much done everything you can do. But, but in terms of the, the deep stuff of his research, I think one of the things that I, that I like most about his research and find inspiring, you know, if you look across cognitive science, whether you're doing formal computational models or not, um, you know, there's, there's often a sort of a divide between people who think about representation and people who think about process or algorithms or inference. And Jacob has really taken both of those seriously and deeply and thought about deep questions of representation. How does the mind represent the world? And what are the principles of inference by which, what, you know, what makes a good representation? And how does the mind figure that out? And just whether he's been working in perception or concept learning or the questions of what's an object or what is an agent, um, he's consistently and in some of the most deepest and really illuminating ways um, try to get at the intersection of inference and representation that's really at the heart of the big questions of cognitive science. And I think from what he's going to talk about here, we're going to get to see at least a, a sample of that in his work on perceptual organization. So let me hand it over to Jacob and think, welcome. <laughs> well, <clears throat> thanks, Josh, for that incredibly flattering introduction. Um, my computer is not waking up. Um, it's incredibly nice to be here. Uh, again, as Josh said, I was a grad student in the BCS department back in apparently the first year that it was called BCS. It was, I, I didn't know this when I came, but it was called psychology up to the minute I got there. Um, but, and of course, when I say it, it was at several buildings ago, so the whole environment has changed tr tremendously. Uh, BCS was an E10, which the younger folk here probably don't even know what that is, but it's a I think a parking lot or something now over on Amherst no, Street. Beautiful media lab building. Of course. Well, <laughs> beautiful wait, new building. New building. Okay. Yeah. I'm not surprised. So <laughs> they've carefully erased every trace of my presence on campus. Um, so, um, well, uh, so I'm going to talk to you today about perceptual organization, which is one of my favorite problems. As Josh said, I've worked on a lot of other things too, but this is in some sense the problem that I care about the most. Um, perceptual organization uh, is a problem that has a whole history, some of tiny bit of which I will tell you about. Um, before I get to what I'm, what I'm personally going to tell you, let me just mention my collaborators on this work, especially Manish Singh, uh, but also Vicky Froy, and these are students, Seha Kim, John Wilder, Erica Briscoe, and a bunch of others. Um, but uh, most of what I'm going to be talking about today is, uh, is joint with, with Manish, who's my, uh, my colleague at Rutgers. So perceptual organization is, um, is the problem by which we put the world together into objects. So we, uh, I'm going to be talking about in the visual domain, although the term is broader than that. Um, you know, the world doesn't arrive uh, at our senses in, in nicely packaged groups. Instead, we have, to, we have to do the grouping. And this is an old, an old problem, but it's sort of fundamental to how we see the world. So, um, you know, so, so this is kind of a trivial example. Here, I'm showing you, I think it's 98 dots. But I mean, most people subjectively see that as being in two groups. And, or two clusters or something like that. And it's pretty intuitive. I hope people can get that that isn't really given, meaning that no matter how obvious the grouping is, um, that that's not inherent in the data. It's a, a mental organization that, that we subjectively place over the data. In that case, a particularly reasonable one. But you might ask, and that's what I'm going to ask, what exactly are the principles that make it, make it reasonable? So it's not just clustering. There are other more subtle aspects of the problem, like here we have one uh, you know, a simple blue region or green on my screen region, but it can be interpreted in a number of ways as having a number of distinct objects. So here you might see it as being some hands. Is it one hand or is it two hands? Is it one blob or is it multiple blobs? You can see that it's not just about grouping things. It's about finding sort of the most coherent or reasonable interpretation of, in this case, the bounding contour, where the bounding contour seems to sort of organize itself into a second hand. And that's intuitively obvious, but it's not obvious what principles we use or what computational mechanisms we use to, um, to, to figure that out. 
So what I'm trying to say is that grouping is an essential aspect of subjective, uh, subjective experience, meaning we see the world as being made of objects, and the question is, why? Because the world is not actually literally made of objects. Um, I'll talk about this a little more later. One might think that there are sort of physical bases for the objects that we see, but it's essentially a subjective aspect of organization. At least that's part of the case that I'll make for you. Um, grouping is also sort of uh, important in the more ordinary senses, like it's, uh, it's, it, it influences other aspects of perception. So there's a huge amount of, uh, of literature in, uh, in the history of perception on studying you know, simple local processes like motion and color um, and some non-local processes like attention. But it turns out that perceptual grouping, grouping influences how those things work in profound ways to the point where in many cases you can't really understand even a simple thing like what color something is perceived to be. I mean, Ted Adelson has done work here that, that illustrates this very strongly. You can't even understand what color something is perceived to, to be unless you understand something about the perceptual organi organization of the surface upon which the color appears. Etc. And it goes without saying that our unitization of the world influences later cognitive processes. But, but organization is basically subjective. And I don't mean by subjective, I don't mean that it's arbitrary. It's, I just mean that it's imposed by the, by the mind. So you know, here, this is just a, a, a bit of art that, that illustrates that point kind of vividly. You have lots and lots of red, white, and blue dots. But of course, most people are going to see this as, as two human figures. And it's, it's obvious, if I can use the pointer here, that some of these blue dots over here are really part of the same person as the, um, as the blue dots over here. And uh, whether or not you actually recognize the original photograph, it's really not obvious why those, those blue dots appear to, to, to group with the other, with the other ones. It's not literally proximity, or it's not uh, contiguity, or any, any sort of obvious superficial principle. It's something, something deeper. So on the, on the point about this being subjective, um, let me just uh, you know, introduce an, an expert witness, uh, Einstein, who, who made this remark. I just, you know, he, of course, was not an expert psychologist, but uh, this always struck me as, as uh, amazingly relevant. Um, he said, out of the multitude of our sense experiences we take mentally and arbitrarily, certain repeatedly occurring complexes of sense impressions and we correlate them to a concept, the concept of the bodily object. Considered logically, this concept is not identical with the totality of sense impressions referred to, but it is a free creation of the human mind. So without dwelling on the philosophy of this, which is a huge topic, um, what I want to talk about for the rest of the talk is, is in what way does the human mind create that concept, if you want to call it. We wouldn't use the word concept nowadays, but in what way does the brain create that concept? Okay, so the traditional answer is these Gestalt laws, which are, were invented in the 19-teens by the Gestalt psychologists. Most people have heard this story and have recurred in, in endless textbooks um, since then, often in simplified form to the point where it looks as if they were written on a stone and brought down from Mount Sinai. So, um, you know, so uh, the Gestalt laws are principle for, in principles for organizing elements into wholes. And the, the word gestalt is supposed to emphasize the idea of whole, which the gestaltists thought was important ab above and beyond local operations as we would call them now. Um, the gestalt laws are often reduced to like three or four simple principles like proximity and similarity, common fate. I mean, most textbooks, if you read them, literally just give these laws as, you know, these are the gestalt laws. Of course, if you actually read the original gestalt writings, it's not nearly that simple and there aren't clearly denumerable laws. And it's also really unclear exactly why there would be just a few laws, where the laws come from, whose idea were the laws, what are the underlying principles. Of course, the Gestaltists didn't have the uh, computational principles or the neuroscience that we have. They did have some amazing insights. But the question of how these, um, these subtle aspects of subjective organization get crystallized down to a few simple rules was, was mostly mysterious if you read their writings. Um, in some versions of the Gestalt principles, there is as many as 114 separate laws. I, you know, I haven't read all the original Gestalt writings, but I once picked up the paper that actually counted the 114, which quoted some of them. And some of them, of course, are all written in German in the original. And if you read them in English, they're really difficult to understand exactly what sentiment is being expressed by these prose versions of the laws. And of course, some of them sound very similar to each other. It's hard to imagine there really are 114 distinct principles. And the Gestaltists themselves, of course, thought that also. So some of them tried to articulate a single underlying law that, um, that sort of was the, the uber law over all of them, uh, which was sometimes referred to as pregnance. Uh, 
Um, so pregnans is one of these words that's not usually translated. Uh, it means something like good form, although I'm sure there's a German speaker here who can give me a better translation. But it, it's deliberately not translated because it doesn't really have a clear uh, correlate in terms of a, a definable meaning, and certainly not a clear computational meaning. It's sort of generally the idea that some organizations, like the one that induces you to see the two kissing figures, or the one that induces you to see the two hands, um, some configurations are sort of more appealing to the mind, more coherent, or perhaps more simple. So simplicity is an idea that's often associated with this. Sometimes simplicity is given as almost a synonym for pregnance, but simplicity itself is very hard to define, or at least it was until relatively recently when, um, as many of you know, uh, a lot of kind of modern advances in the, in the theory of simplicity, some of which I'll mention later, uh, have, have crystallized these ideas a little bit. But the point is that all of these laws are a little bit unmotivated. So again, the Gestaltists were very insightful, but you really can read in vain for a clear articulation of any of the laws, much less a clear computational version of them or a clear motivation. So that brings me to Bayesian inference, which um, probably needs very little introduction uh, to people around here, which is sort of the epicenter of Bayesian inference in cognitive science. Um, but brief, briefly, Bayesian uh, inference is a, is a provably optimal, in a certain sense, method for determining belief under conditions of uncertainty, which perception kind of generally is, and perceptual organization really, really is. It's extremely uncertain what organization to adopt or, or to perceive, and, um, and uh, Bayesian inference is a kind of general method, if only you knew how to apply it, uh, to figure out what interpretation of data is the most reasonable. So um, Bayesian inference involves uh, you know, generative models that, that define likelihood functions. I'm going to say all this fast because I assume people have seen this stuff before. Um, uh, prior probabilities, which, are assign, which assign degrees of belief to each hypothesis um, before considering the data in, in under consideration, such as the, the visual image. And from those, you derive by Bayes' theorem a posterior probability, which is supposed to assign a degree of belief to every possible interpretation of the data. That is, every possible model that might explain, to some degree, the data. So um, uh, the, the, the general claim of Bayesian theory as applied to, to human cognition is that we ought to believe each hypothesis or each model, uh, each perceptual grouping, for, for example, which is where I'm going with this, um, in proportion to the posterior belief according to Bayes' rule, the posterior probability according to Bayes' rule. Um, so this is the math of that, and again, this kind of stuff has become very familiar uh, as it's kind of, well, it's become very popular in cognitive science very broadly. And specifically, it's become extremely popular in perception. So um, there have been many Bayesian models in the last 15 or 20 years uh, of specific areas of perception, motion, and I'll, I'm just throwing up a few references on the screen here. Apologies to anybody that I've, that I've left out. Color, stereo, um, surface shape, which is a little uh, less local. Most of these examples are relatively local um, perceptual qualities that, that are the type of thing that were traditionally studied by people other than the Gestaltists, meaning people who wanted to see how do we perceive a particular color at a particular location. Um, uh, it, has it, has, it has been applied to perceptual organization relatively little. Um, and the problem is that it's very hard to figure out if we're going to be doing like a Bayesian model of perceptual organization, what exactly are we estimating? Meaning that, um, you know, we're trying to estimate like what the objects are, what the groups are, but if you don't believe that the objects have like definite quality that, you know, some things are definitely part of the same object, which is a whole uh, philosophical can of worms, you're just trying to organize, uh, estimate something like subjective organization, it's very hard to formalize the nature of the estimation problem. So are we trying to estimate real physical objects? A lot of people in perception do think about it that way, and I don't mean to dismiss that. But, um, but I mean, to me, it's not really a meaningful question whether two dots are actually part of the same contour, right? So two dots can appear to be part of the same contour if you have a certain model of a contour. Um, and you know, two edges in the actual physical world, you could argue a little more tightly, are part of the same object. But even that is, is very questionable. Again, it's kind of a long uh, story, which I don't want to completely dismiss. But, that, to me, is, is the wrong way of, of thinking about the estimation problem here. In a sense, what we really want to estimate is something like subjective organization, but we need to formalize that somehow because it, we don't want it to be just some inchoate thing. So, um, so I, I'm more or less, for the rest of the talk, going to talk about one particular way of, of concretizing what we mean by subjective organization, um, which is that, we're, that we have object-generating models. These, are, these are, are generative functions that generate data, and those are what we mean by objects, and we're trying to estimate the, the best model of the data, where they, um, this will be more clear when we go on. Specifically, I'm going to talk about mixtures. 
So mixtures are a particular kind of formalism in probability theory, which again has become very popular, and I don't mean to suggest that this is a completely new idea. But mixtures are a very natural way to think about perceptual organization. So a mixture is um, a probability distribution, which is a, uh, a combination of a set of components or sources. So here I'm going to give you what's a two-dimensional uh, array of data with two Gaussian source components. And this is a very familiar situation in stats textbooks. Um, so basically we have one source G1 and another source G2. And G1 is a little Ga circular Gaussian. This is just an example, um, which has some mean mu1 and it has some standard deviation sigma1. And G2 is another source um, which has a mean mu2 and a standard deviation sigma2. And the idea is that each one of those um, generates data. So you might have some samples that are drawn from G1 and some samples that are drawn from G2. And the idea of a mixture generally is that data is generated from some combination of these sources. But then, of course, it's not labeled uh, when the observer actually observes it. So here I took away the color. Um, so here the dots are all black to just to indicate that when the observer observes them, the observer doesn't know a priori which dots or which uh, crosses came from which source. And so the problem of mixture estimation is to figure out which dots came from which source, at, but without knowing what the sources are. So you have to figure out uh, what the sources are, how many there are, what are the parameters of the sources, and that's mixture estimation. So in this example, the way I portrayed it to you, it, it almost looks like a perceptual grouping problem. Of course, not every mixture problem looks like that because the data doesn't have to be visual, doesn't have to be perceptual. But you can, you can get the, the idea of everything I'm going to say for the rest of the talk from this example. The idea is to model perceptual organization as essentially the solution to a special kind of mixture estimation problem. So, um, so estimating a mixture, so this is sort of what I just said, but in general, we don't know the number of components, right? So you have some data, you have some, maybe some ideas of what the components might look like, what the formal models are, like you might have thought they were Gaussians, but you don't know how many there are. So you can fit it with a bunch of Gaussians, I'll give you examples in a few minutes, um, or you can fit it with just one big Gaussian that explains all the data, but maybe doesn't explain it as well. Um, but maybe it's preferable to do it with fewer components than more components, et cetera. You can imagine all of the kind of standard statistical estimation uh, dilemmas that one is um, faced with. Um, specifically, in addition to the number of components, you don't know which component generated which data. I said that already, but let me just restate that in terms that are familiar terminology to perceptual grouping. You don't know the, the ownership. Uh, I'll talk about border ownership later. Border ownership is, is actually a term that's used in, in perceptual grouping to, to refer to, to how uh, particular uh, pieces of contours in images um, are perceived to be quote unquote owned, I'll explain what that means later, by one object or another object. Usually they're understood as being owned by the figure uh, they're, that they're on the boundary of as opposed to the ground that they're on the boundary of. Well, I'll, I'll talk about that later. But the, the terminology is very suggestive because the kind of ownership or labeling that you get in a mixture estimation problem is very similar to the ownership that you got in one of those perceptual grouping problems, like which dot belongs to which cluster in the example, or which dot belonged to which kissing figure in the other uh, image that I showed you. Um, so generally, estimating a mixture uh, means simultaneously estimating the parameters of the sources. Uh, which I'll notate theta 1, although I'm not really going to use that notation later on in the talk, and the ownership of each datum. And the problem is that those two estimation problems interact with each other. You can't just like estimate one and then estimate the other. If you change your model of what the, uh, of what the generating sources are, you're going to change your inferences about which items, which um, data points belong with, with which source, et cetera. And so there's a kind of a cycle of simultaneous estimation, which is very tricky. And that's what makes mixtures, mixtures a very um, important and difficult statistical problem. So, um, so in, a, in a tiny bit more detail, this is essentially the same example. So here we have the um, same kind of thing, a bunch of dots generated by one source and a bunch of dots generated by another source. Now imagine some uh, hypothetical new data point x, um, which appears. So here, now you think of this as a mixture problem or think of it as a perceptual grouping problem. The idea is that x is better explained by g1 uh, than by g2 if the likelihood ratio, um, p of x uh, given g1, is better than or higher than the um, p of x given g2. So in other words, if this ratio is greater than 1, then it seems more plausible that x, one, that x was generated by g1 than that it was generated by g2. And that's a simple way of asking the natural grouping question, um, meaning what does this belong to? What group does this belong to in a, in a probabilistic way? And this kind of simple probabilisticification of the of the, of the problem is, is more or less what I'll talk about for the rest of the talk. The math is, is as I'm going to present it to you today, is really very simple.
almost a vanilla example of Bayesian inference to uh, a data comprehension problem, a data interpretation problem, as long as one understands that the models are objects. Okay, so basically that's the idea. The image is imagined to contain data from a variety of distinct sources, and that's what we're going to call objects. There are different kinds of objects, and I'll talk about several kinds in the talk today. Um, uh, but basically we think of, uh, of, of those objects as stochastic data sources generating data somewhat randomly but under some kind of parametric control in the image. And then our, our problem is to, is to estimate the parameters of the objects, that is like things like their shape, form, uh, depending on what kind of object it is, and um, the assignment of visual uh, items to objects, that's literally the, the grouping part of the perceptual grouping problem. So that's the frame for everything I'm going to say for the rest of the talk. And so now let me say, now I'm going to just give you a, a, a little bit of more formalism to illustrate some particular kinds of object processes and illustrate a bunch of applications of this idea in different domains of perceptual grouping. And I'm going to say all this really fast, meaning I'm not going to give you details of experiments, um, et cetera, but just kind of whiz through a bunch of different examples to illustrate the idea of the approach, which I think is you know, very broadly applicable to a lot of perceptual uh, grouping problems. Um, okay, so here's a, a more detailed version of something I said before. So the, the various interpretations that one can place on the data are different groupings, and, and that doesn't include just the grouping that everybody subjectively sees, but of course the whole point is to understand why you see that as opposed to other ones. So you might, with these same data from the previous slide, you might see all of them as having been generated by a single source. And in a sense, that's a perfectly reasonable uh, interpretation of these of these data. I mean, the the color the colors here are just for your guidance. Those are not part of the part of the data. So you might perfectly well think that it's just one big cluster. And in a certain sense, it is just one big cluster. Um, and there, the posterior would be something like on a cluster times the product of all the of, of the likelihoods, which in this case there's only uh, there's only one of. Right. But then, if you have other interpretations, like here, you you interpret it as two clusters, which of course is what you probably see. But um, put that aside for the moment. This is just another possible competing interpretation. And that one has um, a similar equation, but now there's a prior over two clusters, uh, which, as you can imagine from standard arguments, is going to be a, a lower prior um, because there's more parameters, each of which needs a, uh, needs a prior, and they get multiplied by each other. So, But very broadly speaking, there's going to be some prior for two, which is going to be lower. Uh, but then um, the likelihood function tells you how the data actually fit that model, which is going to fit somewhat better. You're coming closer to fitting the data accurately. And um, uh, similarly, you could do some kind of crazier thing where here I think there are seven sources. Um, you, can, you can see the, the, there's like three of them on this side and four of them on this side. Of course, they don't have to, they don't have to subdivide the way the, the, way the, 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 two, um, the two source interpretation did. I'm just showing it that way for clarity. But then you're going to have a prior on seven sources and this, um, this huge uh, uh, likelihood function, which is a, which multiplies over all all seven. So, so the point is that there are many interpretations, and you can see that some of these are more reasonable than others. Um, and uh, Bayes Bayes rule, Bayes in inference, is designed to 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 uh, to choose among them, or not so much to choose among them as to assign belief to each one in accordance to its in proportion to its posterior. So that's the spirit of it. There are multiple interpretations. Each of them involves grouping the world into different units, maybe of different sizes, and they're different posteriors according to this sort of reasoning. Um, so so here's, the, here's the story. We're going to have some data. I mean, again, this, I'm sort of repeating myself, but this is the big, the big picture story. You're going to have some data, which can be points or edges. And some of the examples that I'm going to show you, they're points. And, and others, it's, it's edges. But that's not really a fundamental issue. It's just different that are generated by different sort of generative models. Um, and then you have various kinds of generative models, which are which we can think of as object classes. There isn't just one kind of object in the world, although it would be nice to have a single uh, central um, object generating class that sort of covers all types of cases if it's suitably flexible. And in a sense, that's what I'm going to show you. But really, you could imagine many different um, types of sources. Like you could have a likelihood function for people and a likelihood function for tools and a likelihood function for cats if you if you wanted. Although that's not really the spirit. Of the, of the examples that I'm going to show you. But really, the, the, the project is larger than the examples I'm going to show you. It's about you have some object class types that generate data, and then you're going to try to make the most reasonable, highest posterior uh, interpretation given those assumptions. Basically, this is what I said. Each interpretation is going to be uh, believed in accordance with it in proportion to its posterior. This is essentially Bayes' rule. I'm leaving out the, the denominator and just indicating proportionality. I will 
in Bayesian theory, we're often coached not to just use the maximum posterior, which is sort of what I've been implying. Um, uh, and you should, in fact, use the full posterior. That means using all the possible interpretations that, you, that are possible in your language um, and believing each one in, in proportion to its posterior. But in perceptual grouping, there is a long tradition and a lot of debate uh, about uh, uh, supporting the idea that uh, we basically just see one interpretation. So I see a bunch of people and a bunch of chairs. I, I don't really see uh, other crazy interpretations where there are, you know, 300 half people or quarter people or whatever it is. You know, I, I am not really subjectively aware of those interpretations. So uh, I'm going to sort of emphasize the, the map, meaning the maximum posterior interpretation. But, uh, but for the Bayesians in the crowd, which I know is not everybody, don't take that too seriously because the, the, the full posterior distribution is very desirable in many situations. It's just that in particular examples, it's often convenient to focus on just one and to be subjectively what we're aware of at any one time in the, in the perceptual grouping problem. OK, so let me just say one general point about um, the history of perceptual grouping uh, you know, theory. So traditionally, there is this idea of the simplicity principle and the likelihood principle. Those are traditional terms in perceptual grouping. I should, for any real hardcore Bayesian in the crowd, the psych psychological likelihood principle is not the same as the likelihood principle that Bayesians talk about, which is a completely different idea. But the simplicity principle is, is just the idea that we see the simplest interpretation, which was traditionally believed by, uh, by the Gestaltists and, and people associated with them. And the likelihood principle often attributed to Helmholtz in the 19th century that, um, uh, that we see the, the, most, uh, the, most, the interpretation that is most likely to be true. And until relatively recently, nobody really had any idea how to formalize that until Bayesian theory came into the field. But um, this is a, a kind of standard argument now, a conventional argument, but 1948 showed, and I'm going to summarize all of information theory here in two bullet points, um, that, uh, that when you have a series, a, a set of models or messages, as he put it, um, the, the, if you want to encode them as briefly as possible, you want to encode each message in proportion to the minus log of the, of the probability of that message. Again, that is a long story, which I, I know is not self-explanatory in those two bullets. But as a result, the, the minus log probability is often described as the description length, because it's the description length in an optimal encoding system. Um, but what that means, uh, and this is a, st a fairly uh, standard argument now, is that maximizing the posterior is the same as minimizing this expression, which is just the log of the posterior. Um, and if you break that down, it's really the description length of the data given the model plus the description length of the model. So in other words, how simple is my model of, of, of the data, meaning of the, of the observations, plus how simple uh, are the data conditioned on the model? If I, if I know that model, how complicated or surprising are the data um, with respect to that model? So the point of this is that you can see that in this way of thinking about things, the quote unquote likelihood principle, which says believe the interpretation that is most likely, is really the same as the simplicity principle. This, this observation in perception, in perception is, is due to Nick Chater. But, um, but the, the math of this pre-existed him and, and it's basically a fairly standard argument. So, so the reason I mentioned all that before getting into specifics is that you can think about everything I'm about to tell you as about Bayesian inference in the usual sense. We're trying to believe interpretation according to its uh, posterior. Or you can just think of it as a version of the simplicity principle. We're trying to come up with the simplest model of the data in front of us. OK, so what are the specific data generating models? So I'm going to tell you about two. The first is for contours. So um, with contours, we just have to make a few probabilistic assumptions to say what we mean by a contour. What, what does that mean? What, what does it mean for something to be a contour? And the assumption is simply that we have a series of, um, uh, of edges, I mean, like this, this long curve. And when you want to pick the next edge, you're going to choose its orientation in a way that is centered on collinear with that edge. Um, and so this graph is supposed to show you the, um, the orientation of the next one relative to the previous one. It's centered on 0, and then it has a roughly bell-shaped, roughly Gaussian distribution. Um, in orientation, one typically uses the von Mies um, distribution, which is very similar to a Gaussian. It's the, it's the circular version of a, of a Gaussian. But it looks like this. This is actually a von Mies, not a Gaussian. But, it's, but they, you know, they're hard to tell, even tell the difference. The, the, basically, what it says is that contours generally continue straight. And with some lower probability, they turn left or turn right. And with extremely low probability, they turn sharp left or sharp right. But generally, they continue straight. And that's all that says. And you can get a lot from that. So what that means is that when you then choose a series of edges, 
It's a Markov chain with, um, uh, of orientations, meaning that each one is chosen independently, conditioned only on the orientation of the previous one. So that's not a great model of contours. For those of you who study contours in detail, it's a very simplified model of contours, but it's surprisingly fruitful. And the point is, it puts some probabilities on the form of the contour in a, in a very reasonable way, meaning in about the most vanilla way that you could. So, um, uh, so what that means specifically is that we can assign a likelihood to, to each contour. So these alphas are supposed to be the, the so-called turning angles. That's the angle of each edge relative to the previous edge. So alpha equals zero is straight. And the, uh, the likelihood of a contour is proportional um, to, the, uh, to, to this expression, which is just the exponentiation of the, the sum of the squared um, turning angles. And that's just what you get from the math, again, in, in the simplest possible way. Um, so that means that if you have a series of edges, so here I'm doing it as, as edges, you could also do this as dots, where every two dots defines an orientation, then you can, you can say what the likelihood of those edges are under the contour model. Of course, there may be other competing models, uh, I'll show you an example in a second, of those edges, but that's the likelihood you get for that model. Um, and that allows us, in turn, to assign posteriors to various ways of grouping the edges, which is like one of the standard problems in the perceptual grouping literature. Um, so here's just one quick example of an experiment that I did a really long time ago. This work goes back into the, to the mid-90s, just to illustrate the scope of time. Um, but uh, so in, in, in this experiment, I asked people to, to just look at dots like this and say, is that one con contours? Those are the only choices. So with the example that you're looking at, it looks more like two contours. But it's obviously a very, uh, very subjective or very unclear decision. But, um, but if I showed you... Uh, I don't think I have it on the slide, but if I showed you six in a row, then you would say it looked like one contour, but with three in one group and three in another group, it looks like two contours. And that's what subjects would typically say in that, uh, in that configuration. So um, measuring the angles here um, in this weird way, which I did back then, um, you end up with the likelihood functions that look like this. So the likelihood function for dividing um, the dots up this way in, in, a, in a group of three and another group of three looks like this, and this, this likelihood and then it refers to those uh, sum of squared turning angles that I showed you in the previous slide. Then you can also group it into two in several other ways, like five and one, one and five, um, or you could group them all into one contour. And then it's one, um, it's one big likelihood function. The way it's written here, it's, it's the, um, it's, it's the likelihood are computed from over the windows of, of all of them, because you want to get all of those consecutive alphas that are, each of which is from three dots in, in an, uh, a series of overlapping windows of three dots at a time. If, if you can visualize what I'm saying. But the point is you get, you actually get numbers out of all of this. And you can actually figure out what the likelihood of, of, of the two, the, the two contours or the likelihood of the one contour interpretation for each of these cases. And again, to make a long story short, it fits what people's judgments are very, very closely. So these are just, these plots I'm just gonna flash up at you. After you compute the posterior and compare it to the human data, you can see it captures some actually surprising aspects of the data. Um, like, for example, the fact that, the, that, that these curves go up at the tails, which is something I did not subjectively uh, anticipate at all before doing this modeling. But the point is it fits human intu intuitions pretty well. Go ahead, Sam. people's kind of is kind of hard. But I wondered what extent you think that this is really drawing on people's object knowledge, right? Because well, objects are much more complicated than individual contours. It's not just a, a point about complexity. It's a point about the contour generation model that seems fundamentally at odds with our object knowledge, right? Because uh, many objects have contours, but in fact, if, you, if you're biased towards a, uh, a line, then you're, you're, you're the highest probability object is in a long, straight line, yeah, right? That's and right. likewise, you know, objects tend to well, okay, let me answer that question in two ways. So first of all, there's a long way between this model and a realistic model of real-world objects, which is certainly far more complicated. But on the narrow question of whether, uh, of closed versus open contours, I mean, you, you could make an, al an alternate model of closed contours. This one specifically is for open contours, in which case the maximum likelihood case really is that they go on forever straight. But so in a few slides, Show you an alternate model that, that gives you closed contours. With what I'm asking is when people look at are they drawing upon their knowledge about objects, or are they drawing upon this kind of other set of uh, other set of prior expectations about contour about sort of uh, fantastic uh, open contours that don't exist? Anymore? 
Well, yeah. I don't know what you mean by the real world exactly, but it's true that they're pulling up models that are appropriate for the experimental situation that they're in. And I, I wouldn't claim that those are, that those generalize terribly well to, to quote unquote real world um, objects. But that's, I mean, that's just a, a, a comment about the limitation of the generative classes, which are very, I mean, the ones I'm, I'm going to show you a few more complicated than this, but they're, they're very limited. So, I mean, I, I take your point. Um, okay, so let me just show you a few other things you can do with this model. So one thing that's very natural is you can, um, you can instead of in, in looking at individual turning angles, you can integrate the, um, the, the likelihood over the, over the model or taking the logs. It's essentially the complexity over the entire contour. So if you simply, this, this is supposed to be a summation over C, meaning C is a contour. Um, over the arc length of a contour, add up the, the log of the probability, the, the minus log of the probability, you end up with a measure of the complexity of the contour. It's very useful in a lot of situations. Um, and, and for example, this is what it, what it looks like. So a straight, this is sort of what Sam was saying before, a straight uh, contour is the best case and a very curved contour is a, is a bad case. Obviously, other models would give other predictions, but, but this is a, is a pretty useful measure of contour complexity, which is something that didn't have a, a nice, neat, um, uh, quantitative um, definition as far as I know before this, but it, it falls completely naturally as a side effect of, of the formalism here. Um, so here's a, 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 a use we put it to experimentally. This is work by John Wilder. So there's actually a contour hidden in this noise, which you probably can barely see. And John pointed out at one point that existing computer vision methods actually can't even find the contour, but our subjects could. So here we asked, I know you can barely see it, but it's up there in the middle somewhere. Um, this is actually exaggerated in contrast compared to the stimuli we actually used. Subjects were simply asked to find the contour. And, the, the, you know, there's just a bunch of black and white pixels. The contour is simply a contiguous region of black. Um, and subjects could do this after some practice. And um, basically, you can model the complexity of this contour, if you can see it there, um, as by the series of turning angles that make it up. And then you can look at the, uh, the likelihood of that. And the minus log likelihood of that is the complexity of that. And for mathematical reasons that I'm not going to explain in detail, but you can imagine if you're familiar with Bayesian theory, um, there's a prediction that uh, that subjects should be better able to to see contours that are simpler. Basically, the simpler they are, the more the, the more easy they are to differentiate from noise. So noise has very high complexity um, and essentially blends into the background. So if we have if the angles, the turning angles zigged and zagged all over the place, it would be extremely difficult to tell the contour from, from the background noise. Um, and so that's, that's essentially the, the idea behind the, the math that backs it up. Um, and so that's, the, so that's a simple empirical prediction. You can see it's basically true. So as the contour DL increases people's performance, this is a, um, a two, alternative, two interval force choice task, uh, decreases with, with complexity. There's a ton of noise in this data because the task is very hard. In this, uh, in this uh, data set. But just to um, make it a, a tiny bit more impressive, here are individual subjects. And you can see, um, you can see the trend in, in almost all of the subjects. Okay, so again, I, I, there's a million details I could go into. But basically, the idea is that patterns, by which I mean objects, are easier to detect the simpler they are. And you can quantify their simplicity with respect to their minus log probability in a kind of vanilla Bayesian theory. You could improve it tremendously with a better model of the objects. And this is a really bad model of contours, especially closed contours. But I'll get back to closed contours, contours in a few minutes. So another much more sophisticated but still pretty limited contour generating model is, an, is axial uh, models, or as I'll call them, skeletal models. So here, um, this you know, is from this, this very famous idea by Blum. Um, you know, that you can think of summarizing uh, the, the, the bounding geometry of, a, of an object by this thing that is, is sometimes called the medial axis or the skeleton. Um, and this is an example of Blum's uh, traditional medial axis transform, where you get this thing that sort of looks like the skeleton of the dog. Um, it, this, the idea that this is important is related to, to David Blum's famous idea, um, again from MIT from many, many uh, years ago, that that a lot of what is mentally represented about object shape is in the axes and is in the structure of, of what is essentially the skeleton. Not literally the bones of the animal, but something actually pretty close to the bones. So he made these pipe cleaner animals that people may have seen pictures of, um, where the, the idea is that you could easily recognize that, say, this is a giraffe, or this is a deer, or this is a dog. Um, and you can easily recognize them, even though from a, almost any normal vision sense, they don't look anything like the animals they're supposed to depict. They don't have the same color, the same texture, the same bounding contour even. All they have is the axial structure. And so uh, 
is a really desirable feature to put into a shape theory, um, and it, it's uh, basically a simple generalization of the contour model uh, that I've shown you already to, to do that. So the idea is that we have a generative model of axial shapes, which is built on the same type of, of, um, of von Mies structure of the, uh, of the sequence of turning angle. It's going to be making the skeleton, not the contour. So the math is, is almost the same, but the use is a little different. So, um, so this is a skeleton, and the idea is that um, from the skeleton sprout these random deviates that go um, to both sides of each skeletal piece. Uh, those, are, those are not pieces of the skeleton, they're just random deviations in the same way that like the, the Gaussian error in a dot cluster. Um, and um, so the structure of the, of the skeleton is, is that, and then once you produce these random deviates, you get an edge born at the end of each arrow, so to speak, at the edge of each random deviate, and that's a shape. And that's a stochastic model for shape. That's a model for shape, which gives you a likelihood model, the probability of a shape conditioned on a skeleton. So we're going to have a prior on skeletons, a prior on the structure of the, uh, of the skeleton itself, and then uh, a likelihood model for, sh for shapes being generated from skeletons. And that is going to allow us to, give, uh, uh, to get a posterior, the probability of a skeleton as a model for meaning of the contour data that you've observed. Um, and just again, just throwing some terminology at you, the, what we call the map skeleton is the, the maximum posterior skeleton that is the skeleton that is the most, that has the highest posterior, meaning the highest product of the prior and the likelihood as an explanation of that data. So for example, that might be the map skeleton for, for these data. I'm showing it to you in the forward direction, but the main question is in the inverse direction. If you just get the outer boundary, what skeleton do you think generated it? I don't literally think that skeletons generated the skin, right? So sometimes people ask me, like, how literally do you take the model? I mean, that's not how, actually how animals are made. I, I learned the birds and the bees a few years ago, and that's not, that's not actually how the process works. But it is a probabilistic model of how bounding contours are made from an imaginary skeleton. Um, and similarly, as I said before, you can think of this in terms of complexity. And we, in my lab, we always talk about these things in terms of DLs, not in terms of probabilities, because they're easier to work with because when you take the log, you get smaller numbers. But conceptually, there's really almost no difference. You take the log, and everything is in terms of the simplest model. You, take the, you don't take the log, and you're thinking about everything in terms of probabilities. It's the same idea. So with, sorry, with a few of the, of the, uh, uh, of the mathematical terms thrown on, it's, I've already really told you, told you the main idea. Um, we are going to uh, give a prior for each skeleton, which is based on the idea that the C here stands for the contour, that's a bad term, for the, um, for the axis itself, the structure of the axis. So the P of, the, of each axis is that same of sum of, uh, or product of von Mies that I showed you before. And then there's a certain probability for each axis to be born, right? So in other words, there's a, there's a cost. Once you take, take the minus log, there's a cost for each axis to be born. And so that gives you this, this nice prior that has this form. If a skeleton has n uh, axes, then it's n times the log of the prior on, on a single piece, a single axis, is the, uh, uh, the sum of all of the, um, the log probabilities of the, <coughs> the, the, the component angles within each axis. Um, and just as before, you can, you can think of that in, as, as, once you take the logs, as dividing up nicely into the, the branching complexity and the summed axial complexity. Um, so like I said, this is a generalization of the contour. With a single contour, it's just the second term. With, uh, with a branching version, you get this, the first term, too. And it's very intuitive. Like, it just falls out of the math, but it's what you'd sort of expect. Um, and you get something that looks like this. So a single axis, like, think, again, think of this as a skeleton now, not a contour, um, has the highest probability, the highest prior, the lowest complexity. And as you add branches or curve the component axes, you get more and more complicated skeletons. And again, intuitively, everybody, I think, would agree that this is a more complicated skeleton than this. And that just falls out of, again, this sort of vanilla math. Um, and the generative model for a shape conditioned on a skeleton is um, we cartooned this a few slides ago. But again, just to give some of the math, you start with an axis or a set of axes. And then once you have the, uh, once you have the skeleton, you generate these random deviates. And there are a few assumptions we make about the, the probability distributions governing exactly where the edge falls and exactly what angle the, um, uh, each of these random deviates deviate. In other words, they don't just go out perpendicularly. They go out at an angle that is centered on perpendicular, but has some, some von Mies uncertainty around it, et cetera. And there's a million other details I'm not telling you which are in the paper, and to be honest, quite a few details that are not in the paper. Um, but then you, get, uh, then, you, then you get a shape from that. So that's the forward model. Um, and 
what we want to do is figure out the most probable um, posterior, that is, the, the, the highest posterior skeleton. And I'll, I will illustrate that with the story of, what is it, Goldilocks, right? So, um, so this is a bear, and this bear is being explained by a single axis, which is too simple. Right? One axis doesn't give a good fit to the data. It's underfit the data, if, if people are familiar with that term, which I imagine some people are. Um, and here is a skeleton that has many pieces, too many pieces, and it has overfit the data. And somewhere in the middle is a skeleton that is just right, right? And that's um, the skeleton that has just one axis per part, which is not cer certainly not perfectly true in the examples I'll show you. But, um, uh, but you can see it's approximately true here. Each, each limb, the color coding here indicates the different axes. Those are different in the model, right? They're separate axes in the model. So, um, uh, so the fact that each of the, of the limbs is, is one uniform color here, different color in each limb, uh, illustrates that it's basically getting the bare right. And, and that's, a, that's a feature of this way of decomposing sh uh, shapes into parts, uh, which is generally not true of the traditional medial axis, which for those of you who've ever worked with it, has lots and lots of spurious axes that don't correspond to parts as soon as there's any noise on the data, uh, noise on the contour. Think of the traditional medial axis as overfitting the, um, the shape, except that when Blum invented it, nobody was thinking about these things probabilistically. But it's very natural, I think, to think about it probabilistically and say, you know, if, you, if your skeleton mirrors every uh, wrinkle in the skin of the, of the animal here in the contour, then you're overfitting but somewhere in the middle you fit, and Bayes' rule is supposed to tell you where that perfect fit is. So that's, that's the, the, map, the map skeleton. It is, a, quote, unquote, the best explanation of the shape. And you can see, I'll just say this briefly, that this gives very reasonable intuitions for part decomposition within shapes. So um, there are many traditional principles of part decomposition, which is like a whole literature about where there's lots of controversy about exactly which rule applies. The most famous rule by far, invented here at BCS, back before it was called BCS, um, was the minima rule by Hoffman and Richards, um, which basically says that these deep concavities are the points at which you tend to divide shapes into parts. That's a principle that seems about right, but nobody ever really understood it because uh, it's si sort of nicely motivated, but it's very hard to do computationally because you have to pair up uh, one concavity with another concavity in order to make a so-called part cut and divide like the finger off from the hand, but exactly how to pair them is not obvious and is not really entailed by the theory. But here you, you see if you get the skeleton, which is the map skeleton, anyway, divided it up into approximately the right, you know, the fingers and the thumb. So it's not perfect, especially because we cut off the hand in an arbitrary way. But it, it's, it's intuitively approximately right. And all of these other principles, like the minimum rule and shortcuts, which is a principle invented by my uh, collaborator Manish Singh, um, that is that the, that the cuts where you cut one part off from the main shape uh, should be as short as possible. You don't need any of those principles. It, they all fall out as side effects. Of the, of the one you know, golden rule, which is Bayes' rule. Um, so, uh, so here is just some examples, which I'll say briefly. So here's a cat, which has been decomposed into approximately um, a reasonable skeleton. When, you can, when I say reasonable, again, I mean that each of the limbs is its own color. It's not really perfect because it, you know, it does group the head all the way into one long uh, piece with the, all the way up to the tail, which you may or may not agree with, but it's not, it's not as unreasonable as, as some other interpretations. And here are some other examples. Again, you can see it does pretty well. Code to do this is available on the web. Um, okay, so back to the main story, though. You want to use this generative model, meaning axial models, as a, as a, a piece of the larger story of how we group things. So here's a, a kind of axial shape, same one I showed you before. And here's another axial shape, and you might have a map skeleton for that. It looks like that. But if you're applying estimation processes to the entire image, there's also axial structure in between the shapes, right? So you don't a priori know where the figure is and where the ground is. So if you see axial structure between, that also can explain some of the contours, but so to speak, from the wrong side, as we know subjectively. But how does the theory know that? Um, so uh, the one way to, to think about this is it's an approach to the figure ground problem. So if you take, this is similar to what I said about a single dot being clustered in one cluster or the other cluster, you can take an edge here and say, is it better explained by this axial structure to its left, or to our left from our point of view, or to the other axial structure to the right? A priori, you don't know which one is figure and which one is ground, but the question is, which one owns this shape, another, this, uh, this uh, edge, meaning which one explains it better? And the general idea is that 
which, given a whole contour, a whole uh, boundary, whichever side explains it better is the side that's interpreted as figural. So again, this kind of falls out as a side effect of the, of the, of the approach that the, the figure ground problem falls out. I, again, I hate to say that because it sounds so grandiose. There are many aspects of the figure ground problem that this doesn't even touch. But the assignment of, it, of an edge to one side or the other, to the figure side or the ground side, sort of follows that whichever side explains it better is interpreted as figure. Um, and that's, again, that's what's traditionally referred to in the, in the, perception, in the figure ground literature as border ownership. And that's almost the same terminology that's used in the mixture estimation um, uh, literature. It's, it's data ownership. So here's, again, very briefly an experiment kind of demonstrating this. Um, so Seha Kim and I did this experiment where we put a little probe down at a boundary between two objects, two different colored objects. The probe, uh, if you want details, is a little shimmering, vibrating thing, which we then ask the subject. It's kind of clever and kind of amazing that this works. This thing, these two frames alternate very rapidly, and you see a little vibrating uh, divot on the border, and you simply ask the subject, what color is vibrating? And they, they answer whatever is figure, because quote unquote figure owns the border. And so it's kind of, if you think it's the uh, blue region, then they think that blue is vibrating, although of course physically both sides are vibrating equally. The, the uh, figure itself is symmetric, the, the divot itself is symmetric. So we had an axial figure on one side, and a symmetric figure on the other side, which is made by just reflecting the, the, the boundary around it, around an imaginary symmetry axis. And so it, the one side is always symmetric, which is a, a clue to figure, and the other side is axial to degree, which we manipulated. Um, and, you know, again, the idea is with these very simple equations, you can basically say whatever, you know, the, the difference in these two description lengths tells you which side is better explained. Um, in other words, there's a skeleton on both sides, and whichever uh, whichever skeleton explains it better, that's the side that they're going to see is, um, is, and, you know, it basically worked. I mean, this data is incredibly noisy because there are a number of other factors influencing the, um, the figure round determination, but if you can believe this data, which I mostly do, um, then you can see that as the, as the DL increases the, on, on one side, on the side we're manipulating, the probability that, um, of the subject saying, saying that that side is figure, um, decreases according, to the, according to, the, to, the, to the magic formula. So again, I'm not going to go into any more details of the experiment, but basically it, it sort of works. So the idea is that when you, you can group an entire image this way, so this, the, algorithmically this goes way beyond what we've actually done, but just to illustrate the idea, um, you know, if you have several skeletal objects in the, in the image, when, they, when they're both there and they project, um, they project to, some, to some set of edges, you can basically try to start figuring out which skeletal pieces explain the data. And, and one way to do this, not the only algorithmic way, is to start peeling off well explained by one axis. So if you peel off this piece, which has the strongest axial posterior, and then, um, so it's interpreted as an object which then ipso facto is in front, right? Because you're seeing it as figure. In other words, it's explained without any occlusion. So it's interpreted as in front, and that leaves the rest of the data to be explained by some subsequent axial uh, model, and then that is interpreted as behind. So you can see that you get a rudimentary relative surface depth. You don't get any actual depth or anything, but just relative surface depth. There's lots of limitations to this, um, like here the skeletons are all one are, are all two-dimensional, right? There's no three-dimensional skeletons at this stage of development. But um, uh, you can imagine how this allows you to not just group things, but to also to sort of figure out where the surfaces are and how they lie relative to each other. So same corollary of what I said before about um, the description length of individual contours. Um, just as you can do that for individual contours, you can compute a shape complexity measure for whole closed shapes, right? And, and so we did, so again, John Wild and I did a very similar experiment to the one I showed you before, but now where the shapes were, instead of being little contours embedded in noise, they were whole shapes embedded in noise. And again, I'm sure people probably can't see the shape. Anybody see the shape? What is it? It's the same cat I showed you before. I like that cat. Uh, so there's the cat, and they're very hard to see these shapes, but people can see them. And we now have, two, there it gets a little complicated, we now have two complexity measures. This relates to Sam's question from before. Um, uh, so one is the simple contour complexity, as if that shape was simply seen as a long, uh, as a long open contour, which just happens to close, but that's not part of the model. And the other is the, um, uh, is the kind of axial or skeletal shape complexity measure, which you get from the skeletal model that I, that I 
that I just showed you. And those give you two complexity measures which are not independent, statistically independent of each other, but they are kind of conceptually independent and they do give different numbers. They're, they're somewhat correlated. So, uh, so again, I'll just show you some data very briefly and again, very noisy task, but you can see, it, it turns out, it doesn't, it doesn't look super uh, impressive from this graph, but both of these turn out to be quote unquote significant, uh, meaning that they're both statistically meaningful factors in people's judgments. The more complex a both in the contour sense and in the skeletal sense, meaning in the global shape sense, um, the harder it is to detect. And again, that comes straight out of the, out of the theory. So, um, so, you know, now, I mean, it's, it's getting kind of repetitive. I, keep given the, I guess I've given the main idea. How, I mean, how much time? I know it's five. It's, uh, sort of five yeah, I, I can do most of what I was going to do. In yeah, yeah. Okay, so, this is, a, this is work by Vicky Fry, and this is a, a nod towards something more like a performance theory. What I've been giving you so far is essentially the competence theory, meaning I'm sort of stating it in the abstract without any algori algorithm to, to actually compute these things, although of course all the examples were computed by various algorithms. But more recently, Vicky figured out a, a, a kind of a way to, to, fig to, uh, to actually, um, in a fairly tractable way, to actually compute some of this stuff. So it's based on, um, uh, on a technique called Bayesian hierarchical clustering, due to um, Zubin, who was a BCS student when I was here, um, and uh, Lori Heller, right, that was um, uh, where it, the, the theory is essentially the same, but let me just skip ahead to the algorithmic part. So basically we're gonna, this is actually their model, but ours is the same for perceptual grouping. Basically you build a tree, you're trying to cluster some data, and you build a tree based on a, a kind of Bayesian criterion for whether things are joined together into a cluster in the tree. And you end up with this hierarchical tree, which you can then analyze for how it groups things into, um, how it groups the, the data points into uh, clusters in a hierarchical sense. So they have this thing called tree slices. So tree slices are basically what level you see the tree. So this is the overall tree that you might have gotten from these data. And slicing it up here, you get two clusters. And if you slice it down, down there, you get three clusters. So you can see the hierarchy because one of the clusters has subdivided into two. And again, these are it's based on a finer and finer uh, modeling of the data. And if you slice it down there, you get, you get more, et cetera. I, I, I said, said that wrong. It's one up there, then two, then three. So we apply this idea basically in the perceptual grouping context. So you can see on the side here, if you can see where I'm pointing, these are um, dot figures similar to the ones I showed you from the experiment before, where you can see this as a smooth contour or maybe as several pieces or several pieces with a corner, et cetera. And if you can see the tree here, the tree basically gives the decomposition right in the sense that if you take the, a slice at the, at the middle level, at the maximum posterior level, you get the subjective uh, division into two different pieces that you actually probably perceive here, like the red and the blue section. So it, it kind of fits intuitions. At least this is a bit of instant psychophysics. And um, on the data that I showed you before, it gives this um, kind of impressive fit to, to the, the human judgments that I showed you before. So the model predicts a posterior for every decomposition and people's judgments are in proportion, in a nice linear proportion to that posterior. Here's a slightly richer problem. So this is, uh, but it's the same technique exactly, uh, dividing this set of uh, dots into, um, into some sort of skeletal model. So here the skeleton has a slightly different representation from what I showed you before. It can have separate pieces, but um, but basically, you have all these, these dots around which define a shape, and then at various levels of the, of the tree, you can slice it at various levels into either um, into being one shape or two, sh or two one whole shape with, with just one part, or uh, various ways of subdividing into multiple parts. And here, the color coding is supposed to indicate the various subdivisions, the model estimated for these different shapes, and you can see they're highly intuitive. Now, these are super simplified shapes, meaning these are not realistic shapes in natural images or anything like that, but at the level of a kind of gross um, theory, it, it, gives, uh, it, it, makes, it get, gives a sort of sanity check for the idea that if you have a reasonably appropriate probabilistic model of, in this case, parts of a shape, you get reasonably plausible intuitions out of the posterior. Um, another you get sort of for free with the Bayesian theory is the posterior predictive pred uh, distribution, which, which predicts missing data. So predicting missing data has a, has a whole a huge, uh, is a huge topic in, in machine learning and statistical learning, but, in, but what it means in perceptual grouping is what's called shape completion. So if you have, for example, one of these shapes down here, um, uh, stimuli down here where there's one shape occluding another, if you use, using this BHG technique, um, you make a model of each shape, 
it entails a predictive distribution for the, the data that is missing, that is the data that's occluded behind the shape. So, and, and here again, I'm just throwing examples at you. Um, this, uh, you know, this model correctly predicts that you're going to sort of complete the contour over here. This is the missing stuff. And so, when you, in other words, when you see the, a blue shape completing behind the red bar, that's like saying that your posterior predictive thinks that there's data that just sort of completes this straight. But it doesn't just do everything, you know, straight like a contour. It's, it's based on the, the implied skeleton. And there are various examples that, that show that it's not always what, the, um, what is just uh, predicted by a smooth continuation of the contour. So it gives a solution to, to that, kind of, and there's a whole literature on perceptual completion, which you know, doesn't even connect very closely to the figure ground literature or the clustering literature or various other literatures. But here you can see them all as side effects of the same basic uh, formalism. So that's all I have time for explaining in terms of uh, specific areas of application. Let me just briefly mention a few other important areas of application I haven't mentioned. Um, so one is, is 3D surface shape. So Seha Kim, who was mentioned on a previous slide, her PhD thesis from a few years ago uh, extended this to sort of predict the, um, the surface implied by line drawing. This is one of these problems that co modern computer vision doesn't pay a lot of attention to um, because we're just so used to working with full color, full texture, naturalistic images. But it is, to me, it's an embarrassment to cognitive science that in 2017, we have no idea how people infer 3D shape from a simple line drawing like this. Um, and the idea is something like Bregnant's. You have, you know, this 3D, uh, this, this contour implies a 3D shape that seems to have, you know, certain surfaces, surface points closer and certain surface points farther away. It's not just a silhouette and it's also, right, it, it, you know, it's, it, you don't need all the texture and shading cues, you know, uh, all, the, all the things that have been studied, some of them here at MIT, um, that, that have been looked at in this literature. You just, just based on the outer bounding contour and some pieces of important uh, informative internal contour, you can see a 3D shape. And basically, we have no idea how that works. But a, a very complicated extension of the model that I, uh, that I showed you, which I don't have time to explain, uh, gives a prediction for what surface normal people see, which tends to fit uh, human judgments for very simple shapes uh, pretty well. So ask me more if you want about that. Um, and another really important application is shape similarity. So if you have a skeletal model of one shape and a skeletal model of another shape, a very natural is, okay, how similar are the shapes? Another problem that we don't really have good models of. Um, similarity is another one of these things that is very obvious, but is also kind of subjective, so it's very hard to model. There's, again, a huge literature on similarity, in not just in shape, in where shape matching and computer vision is a, is a whole field, uh, but also in, in, um, in other areas of cognitive similarity is a very important concept. Josh has worked on getting some very important ideas related to this. Um, so, Long story short, and again, I don't, actually, I do have slides about this if people have questions. Um, you can estimate similarity using an extension of the same probabilistic argument. In other words, without a lot of new ideas, just basically how similar are they in the sense that a Bayesian would answer that question. Um, and you can make a prediction. And so here I'm showing you one graph's worth of data comparing predicted similarity to judged similarity for human subjects. So, in conclusion. Um, you know, perceptual grouping can be thought of as a Bayesian estimation problem. It's an estimate, an estimate of organization, as long as you can quantify exactly what we mean by organization. And what I tried to convince you of is it's essentially it's, it's like a mixture model. There are some weird aspects to the mixture um, component definitions that are very different in the perceptual grouping problem from what you might see in a mixture modeling statistics book. But broadly, it's the same kind of problem. Um, you have to make some assumptions about the generative models, and the assumptions I gave as examples are very, very simple, but I mean, a, a natural way to extend the theory is to give better generative models. Um, basically, it's a sanity check that, at least for simple examples, it gives the right intuitions. Um, and the general idea is that the interpretation, which was formally defined by these vague hand-wavy gestalt principles, essentially corresponds to the maximum posterior, or if you want to put it that way, the minimum complexity decomposition into source components. So that's fancy terminology for the basic idea that we want to explain the data in front of us in the simplest possible way. Um, and again, the idea is that this unifies all these Gestalt principles, as well as a lot of other principles from other areas of perceptual organization that the Gestaltists weren't even as interested in. These are literatures that are dizzying because of the number of new principles that are introduced. Every paper is a new principle, and the different types of perceptual grouping often don't even interact with each other to even see 
or the principles sound kind of similar. So I know that it's an oversimplification to say it's all Bayes' rule. And I know people at MIT are probably tired of hearing the assertion that everything is Bayesian. But the point is, I mean, what is attractive to me is the simplicity of the models. You have um, basically generative models of contours that are just the simplest possible thing you could say about a contour. Generative models of shapes that are almost the simplest thing you could say about whole multi-part shapes. But then you get approximately the right intuitions out of, well, out of that. Um, and it, it predicts some data. I know I went over the data very quickly. Um, but it also predicts a lot of things that we haven't tested yet. This is a huge project, which I probably be doing. Thanks. All right, that's... <laughs>